Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you start to enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and make sure you turn the notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. There's a lot of you that's been waiting for this, so I am bringing parts 5, 6, 7, and 8 that is the last of this series. Just as soon as I get done with this one, there is another series right behind it. For all of you fictional horror lovers, I like both, real and fiction. So if you don't like fiction, this video is not going to be for you. With all that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled The Sixth Floor. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I begin reading, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. As I opened the door wider, I stepped into the hotel room and took in my surroundings. It appeared to be a standard, albeit slightly outdated, room. The wallpaper featured intriguing geometric shapes, lending the space a retro charm. The walls were painted a somber shade of dark gray, adding to the room's subdued atmosphere. In the center of the room, a couch and a recliner sat opposite each other, flanking a small table. A modest 12-inch TV hung on the wall, its plastic casing showing signs of wear and tear. On either side of the TV hung paintings, one depicting a serene cruise ship with passengers enjoying their vacation, while the other depicted the very room I was standing in. Every detail meticulously captured with uncanny precision. Despite the familiarity of the scene, a sense of unease lingered in the air, casting a shadow over the otherwise ordinary room. I made my way towards the bedroom area located at the back of the room, noting the absence of a door separating it from the main living space. Another TV, noticeably older in model, greeted me, invoking a sense of nostalgia with its 1960s design. The bed, lightly made up with three neatly arranged pillows, stood as the centerpiece of the bedroom. Despite the inviting appearance, a subtle sense of disquiet lingered in the air, amplifying the feeling of unease that had been gnawing at me since my arrival on the sixth floor. With recorder in hand, I began to document my surroundings, each click and whir capturing the essence of the mysterious explorer of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Blackwood, and I'm here to investigate the enigmatic sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel, also known as the Devil's Floor. I announced, my voice talking on a mysterious tone to captivate my audience. With every word, I aim to draw my listeners deeper into the unfolding mystery of this notorious location. Talking to the boss who runs the place, you guys are going to love this one. So, he showed me a fire detailing every person who took their own lives on this sixth floor floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Let me tell you, I'm not that convinced. I've been here for a while and nothing really happened, I replied, injecting a note of skepticism into my voice, despite the ominous reputation of the sixth floor. I remained steadfast in my belief that there was more to the story than meets the eye. Fitting to check the bathroom. I muttered into the recording, my voice tinged with a mix of anticipation and apprehension. 
With each step, I inch closer to unraveling the secrets that lay hidden within the walls of the Grand Dolphin Hotel's infamous sixth floor. Entering the bathroom, I found it to be surprisingly ordinary, with no immediate signs of macabre or supernatural. The tiles were a dull shade of white, slightly worn with age, but otherwise clean and well-maintained. A standard bathtub stood against one wall, accompanied by a modest shower curtain. The sink adorned with a simple mirror above appeared functional but unremarkable. As I surveyed the room, I couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment. Perhaps I had expected too much, or perhaps the true stories of the sixth floor were yet to reveal themselves. So, I guess there's nothing weird about the bathroom. No paranormal activity. I knew it. I muttered into the recording, my disappointment evident in my tone. Clicking off the recording, I turned my attention to the room, only to be met with an unexpected sound a faint melody drifting from a radio outside the bathroom. The music, old-school jazz with piano and clarinet, filled the air, creating an eerie atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. Unsure of how the radio had turned on by itself, I cautiously approached the sound. Leaving out of the bathroom, my eyes darting around the empty room for any sign of movement. The radio sat innocently on the drawer next to the alarm clock, its display flashing 12 p.m. in an endless loop. I stood there, my gaze fixed to the radio, its haunting melody filling the room. With a sense of trepidation, I clicked on my recorder once more. The radio was playing and somehow it turned on by itself, I spoke into the recording my voice betraying a mixture of confusion and unease. As I continued to watch the device, a chill crept up my spine, leaving me to wonder what other secrets the sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel held within its grasp. With cautious steps, I approached the radio, my eyes scanning its surface for the off button. My hand trembled slightly as I reached out, fingers hovering over the controls. Finally, I located the switch and pressed it firmly, silencing the eerie melody that had been filling the room. As the music faded away, a sense of relief washed over me. But the unease lingered, reminding me that there was more to this place than met the eye. As I looked out the window, my confusion deepened even further. Not only was I not on the sixth floor as I had believed, but I seemed to be far higher than any normal building should be. In fact, I realized with a jolt that I was an astonishing 264 stories above the ground, a height that defied the laws of physics and left me reeling with disbelief. How could this be possible? Wasn't I on the sixth floor? It was as if the Grand Dolphin Hotel existed in a realm beyond the constraints of reality, where normal rules no longer applied. As I struggled to comprehend the enormity of what I was witnessing, a sense of dread settled over me, chilling me to the core. Whatever secrets lay hidden within the walls of this mysterious place, it was clear that they were far more sinister and otherworldly than I could have ever imagined. With a trembling hand, I backed away from the window, the implications of my discovery weighing heavily on my mind. Going to sit down on the couch, I felt the weight of unease settle heavily upon me. With trembling hands, I reached for my recorder, offering a semblance of comfort in the midst of uncertainty. Pressing the record button, I began to speak, my voice shaky with disbelief. So, um, I looked outside from my window, and I swear to you, I, 
I ordered a room on the sixth floor, but when I look down, it it just doesn't even look like I'm on the sixth floor. It, it looks like I'm higher than that. I, I don't know. I, I think my mind is playing tricks on me, I explained, my words trailing off as I stared out the window, my unease growing with each passing moment. As I sat there, grappling with the impossible reality of my surroundings, I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister lurked just beyond my understanding. With a heavy heart, I turned off the recorder, unsure of what to do next in this strange and unsettling place. Then, I heard a song playing very loud from my radio, the lyrics going, Sleep, little girl, cause when you wake, it's gonna be a different world. So close your eyes and say goodbye to spring. It's true, this spring is coming, going to end. You're not that fragile anymore. I know there's more behind that door and it's just waiting in the wings to pull you in. I know you think it's safe in here inside these insulated walls, but I can hold this house together not forever yet and soon it's gonna fall. Really quick, I'm a terrible singer. Sorry about that. Back to the story. <laughs> The lyrics of the song flooded the room with an unsettling ambience, their haunting melody echoing off the walls like a chilling whisper from the unknown. As the music played, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease creeping over me, a palpable tension that seemed to hang heavy in the air. With each verse, the lyrics painted a vivid picture of impending doom their words dripping with a sense of foreboding that sent shivers down my spine. The imagery they conjured was stark and vivid, evoking a feeling of dead that seemed to seep into every corner of the room. As I listened, I couldn't shake the feeling that the song held some deeper meaning, a hidden message buried within its haunting refrain. It was as if the music itself was trying to warn me of the dangers that lurked within the walls of the Grand Dolphin Hotel, urging me to heed its ominous words. Despite my best efforts to push aside my growing unease, I found myself unable to ignore the sense of impending danger that hung in the air like a thick fog. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realized that the song was just the beginning of the mysteries that waited me in this strange and unsettling place. As I rose from the couch, the jarring sound of the song reverberated throughout the room, its lyrics still echoing in my ears. My gaze landed on the bed, where a solitary chocolate bar lay perched atop the neatly made covers. The sight caught me off guard as I couldn't recall bringing any snacks with me into the room. With the music blaring in the background, I hurried over to the radio, my hands fumbling with the controls in an effort to silence the unnerving melody. As I reached for the off button, my eyes flickered back to the chocolate bar, its presence in the room seeming out of place and inexplicable. I couldn't shake the feeling of confusion that washed over me, my mind racing to make sense of the situation. Had someone else entered the room while I was distracted? The thought sent a chill down my spine, and I found myself scanning the room anxiously for any sign of a presence. But as I looked around, there was no one else in the room to be seen. No indication that anyone else had been in the room with me. The silence that followed the cessation of the music only served to amplify the sense of unease that lingered in the air, leaving me to grapple with the unsettling mystery of the inexplicable chocolate bar. As I stepped into the living room, the TV flickered to life all on its own accord emitting a low buzzing noise that filled the air with an eerie static. 
My heart quickened as I watched the screen, realizing with a sinking feeling that it was playing scenes from my own life. The images were all too familiar. The solemn gathering at the funeral, the two caskets side by side, the somber words of the pastor as he recited scripture. It was as if I was reliving those painful moments all over again, the memories cutting through me with a sharp clarity. Driven by a mix of fear and disbelief, I hurried over to the TV, my hand shaking as I tried to switch it off. But no matter how many times I pressed the power button, the screen remained illuminated, the haunting images playing on an endless loop. Desperate now, I reached for the power cord, intending to unplug the TV and silence its unsettling display. Yet, even as I yanked the cord from the wall, the screen continued to glow, the images flickering relentlessly before my eyes. Frustration and confusion gnawed at me as I grappled with the inexplicable phenomenon my mind racing to find a rational explanation for what was happening. Was this some kind of elaborate prank, or had someone, somehow, gained access to my room and tampered with the electronics? With a sense of unease settling over me, I reached for my recorder, the familiar click of the button filling the room with its mechanical hum. I don't know what this is, I began, my voice trembling with uncertainty. How do you, how do they know about my family, my life? Is this all part of some twisted show? But before I could continue, a sudden noise interrupted my thoughts a sharp banging emanating from the direction of the caskets on the screen. My breath caught in my throat as I watched, transfixed, the figures in the recording turning to face me with empty, emotionless gazes. A shiver ran down my spine as I listened to the sound echoing through the room, the weight of the moment pressing down on me with a suffocating intensity. What? I whispered, my voice barely audible above the den of my racing heart, as I turned to find the figures on the screen now staring directly at me, their gaze penetrating and unnerving in its intensity. With my voice barely rising above a whisper, I uttered, Are they... are they staring at me? My words trembled with fear, a knot forming in the pit of my stomach as I struggled to comprehend the surreal scene unfolding before me. Frantically, I scanned the room for a way out, my gaze landing on the phone resting on the bedside table by the window. With trembling hands, I hurried over to it, my fingers fumbling over the buttons as I dialed the front desk each press sending a jolt of anxiety coursing through me. Every second stretched out into an antagonizing eternity as I waited for someone to pick up on the other end. The silence seemed to amplify the pounding of my heart as I held the receiver to my ear, straining to hear any sign of life on the line. After what felt like an eternity, the phone line crackled to life and a voice finally answered on the other end. Hello? Uh, front desk, C can you hear me? I practically shouted into the receiver, my voice trembling with urgency and fear. Automated voice. This is an automatic voice call. Please press 1 to connect to the front desk. My trembling fingers pressed 1. Thank you for calling the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Please stand by while we place you on hold. Your call is important to us. Did you know that our restaurant offers a delectable selection for breakfast options, including fluffy pancakes, crispy bacon, and freshly brewed coffee? For a limited time, guests can enjoy the complimentary continental breakfast 
with their stay. Please press 1 to learn more about our breakfast menu. Discover the culinary delights of the Grand Dauphin Hotel's renowned restaurant. Indulge in mouth-watering dishes crafted by our talented chefs, from succulent steaks to savory seafood specialties. Don't miss our daily happy hour specials at the bar, featuring handcrafted cocktails and the premium wine selection. For reservations, press 2. To learn more about our room service options, press 3. Thank you for choosing the Grand Dolphin Hotel, where every meal is an unforgettable experience. The automatic voice continues to play various advertisements about the hotel's dining options while the caller remains on hold. Are you craving a satisfying meal after a long day of travel or sightseeing? Then look no further than the Grand Dolphin Hotel's room service menu. From gourmet burgers to classic pasta dishes, our extensive menu has something for everyone. Press 4 to place an order for room service directly from your room. And don't forget to inquire about our special promotions and discounts for hotel guests. Thank you for your patience, and we'll be with you shortly. The automatic voice continues to play various advertisements about the hotel's dining options while the caller remains on hold. Hello, this is the front desk. How may I assist you? I demand to know what the fuck is going on with my TV and the chocolate. Why the fuck is there a recording of me at a funeral? What, what kind of twisted game is this? I swear I will sue all of you if you don't give me some fucking answers. Do you hear me? My voice rose in frustration and anger, the fear of the unknown driving my desperation for answers. Are you ready to check out? I'm ready to check out, and I want a fucking refund for this nightmare of a stay. I exclaimed angrily, my patience wearing thin as fear, and frustration continued to consume me. All right, sir, we'll send you the things you need to check out. I sat down on the floor, feeling a wave of relief washed over me, knowing that someone was finally coming up to me. After a couple of minutes, I heard a knock at my door, broke the tense silence, that had settled in the room. As I approached the door, my heart raced with anticipation. Opening it slowly, I found a box placed just outside. With caution, I knelt down and began to open it, revealing a rope inside. Suddenly, a voice echoed from the phone, sending shivers down my spine. Are you ready to check out? My disbelief turned into horror as I turned towards the phone, my expression filled with shock. What the fuck? I muttered. My heart pounded so hard I could feel it in my chest. A wave of nausea washed over me, leaving me feeling numb and helpless. Panic engulfed me as I sprinted out of the hotel room, down the corridor, passing door after identical door, each bearing the number 144. My heart raced and my breath came in ragged gasps. Turning a corner, I expected to find the elevator, but to my horror, it was nowhere to be seen. Frantically, I searched for any sign of escape, but every corridor looked the same, Every fucking door identical. This, this can't be real, I muttered, my voice barely audible. As I grappled with shock and disbelief, unsure of what was real and what was merely a nightmare. I got curious and I stopped at one of the doors. I opened it as I stepped through the door. A sense of deja vu washed over me. And I found myself back in the same hotel room exactly as I had left it. My belongings lay untouched, the eerie calm of the room mocking my confusion. Oh my God, where the fuck am I? I whispered, my voice just barely audible in the silence that surrounded me. 
I walked slowly toward the window, my hand trembling as I reached out to grasp the heavy curtains. With a hesitant motion, I pulled them to the side, allowing a sliver of dim light to filter into the room. Peeking through the glass, my eyes widened in shock as I beheld the desolate scene outside. The darkness stretched endlessly, devoid of any signs of life or civilization. There were no twinkling lights, no distant sounds of the city, just an overwhelming void that seemed to swallow everything in its path. My breath caught in my throat as I stared into the abyss, feeling a sense of unease creeping over me with each passing moment. With a shaky hand, I clicked on my recorder, the soft sound of the button echoing in the silence of the room. I... I don't know where I am. I began, my voice trembling slightly. I... I, I looked outside my window and I saw nothing but darkness. I tried running out of my room, but all I found were identical doors with the same number. I, I, I don't know where I am. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe there's such a thing as the supernatural. I, I don't want to die here. Despite my attempts to sound calm, a sense of dread gnawed at my insides, leaving me feeling utterly helpless in this unfamiliar place. I sat there, my head buried in my hands, trying to make sense of everything. Suddenly, movement caught my eye, and I looked up to see a woman in a white dress standing in my room. She held a baby in her arms, and tears streamed down her face. Without a word or even a glance in my direction, she walked slowly toward the window, my heart pounded in my chest as I watched her approach the edge. Without hesitation, she stepped off and disappeared into the darkness, below her cries fading into the void. The room fell silent once more, leaving me frozen in shock and disbelief. The sound of sobbing drew me toward the bathroom. With trembling steps, I entered the tiled room to find a man dressed in an old-fashioned suit from the 1930s. Tears streamed down his face as he sat hunched over the bathtub, blood flowing from deep gashes on both of his arms, and a knife lay nearby, its blade stained crimson. Without a word, the man let out a final anguished cry before slumping lifelessly into the tub. The silence that followed was deafening, broken only by the sound of my own ragged breaths as I stood there, paralyzed by the horrifying scene before me. I walked out of the bathroom. The tension in the room was palpable as I laid eyes on the mysterious figure in the trench coat and hat. Standing in the living room, his penetrating gaze bore into mine rendering me motionless and uncertain of how to respond. As he slowly approached, my heart pounded in my chest, torn between flight or fight. Then, with a chilling gesture, he removed his hat, revealing a gruesome wound on his head that oozed blood. My breath caught in my throat as I watched him produce the knife from within the hat, sending shivers down my spine. Before I could react, the sound of the phone pierced the eerie silence, jolted me back to reality. Are you ready to check out? No, I whispered, my voice barely audible, my eyes fixed on the man, his unsettling gaze sending shivers down my spine. He swung at me with his knife, but I dodged it and bolted out of the room. His footsteps echoed ominously behind me, urging me to run faster. As I dashed down the hall, the lights began to flicker and extinguish one by one, casting shadows that seemed to reach out for me. 
Desperation fueled my movements as I sprinted towards an open door labeled 144. I burst into the room, slamming the door shut behind me just as the final light blinked out. In the darkness, I listened intently, hearing the man's frenzied footsteps drawing closer. I held my breath, hoping he wouldn't find me. Peering through the peephole, all I could see was an abyss of darkness outside. Turning away, I realized with dread that I was still trapped in the same room, my heart sinking as the realization of my predicament set in. Exhausted and overwhelmed, I sank to the floor, leaning my back against the cold surface. Every muscle in my body ached from the relentless running and the terror that had gripped me. I closed my eyes, trying to steady my ragged breaths and calm the racing thoughts in my mind. It felt like the world was closing in on me, and I struggled to make sense of the nightmarish event unfolding around me. I heard the radio playing very loud again, this time saying different lyrics from the last song. Lay impetuary soul to rest, yeah. I will try to do my best to keep you safe inside this nest and keep the gravity from pulling you to earth. I'd like to say this gets more clear when it's more cloudy every day. But summer's gonna come and burn the stormy clouds and all the doubt away. The lyrics echoed throughout the room, filling the space with a haunting melody. I listened, my heart heavy with the weight of the words. It felt as though the song was speaking directly to me, offering a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos and confusion. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom that lingered in the air. Sleep, little girl, cause when you wake, it's gonna be a different world. So close your eyes and say goodbye to spring. It's true this spring is coming to an end. You're not that fragile anymore. I know what's there behind that door, and it's just waiting in the wings to pull you in. I know you think it's safe in here inside these insulated walls, but I can hold this house together, not forever. Yeah, and it's soon gonna fall. The lyrics reverberated throughout the room, each word sending shivers down my spine. It was as though the song was speaking directly to my soul, warning of impending danger and urging me to prepare for what was to come. As the haunting melody filled the air, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease creeping over me, like a dark cloud looming on the horizon. Despite the fear gnawing at my insides, I couldn't tear myself away from the hypnotic rhythm of the music each note carrying a weight of its own. As the music got even louder, I heard a kick behind me at the door. My heart dropped. Is he back? I ran to the bed area where I could hide. I got on my knees and crawled under the bed. The music still playing very loud. The eerie music playing as someone kicking the door down. Slow down, cause winter's just around the bend. Don't make a sound and close your eyes and say goodbye to spring. The eerie music continued to play, its haunting melody echoing throughout the room like a sinister symphony. With each note, the tension in the air grew thicker, suffocating me in its grasp. Suddenly, the song of someone kicking the door down shattered the fragile silence, sending shockwaves of fear coursing through my veins. As the door creaked open, revealing the ominous figure standing on the threshold, I felt a chill run down my spine. The lyrics of the song seemed to take on a new meaning, their words resonating with the impending sense of doom that hung heavy in the air. Closing my eyes, I braced myself for whatever horrors awaited me, on the other side of spring. 
The sudden cessation of the music plunged the room into an unsettling silence, broken only by the sound of my own ragged breath. In the doorway stood a figure, a silhouette, cast a shadow against the dimly lit backdrop of the bedroom. Clad in what appeared to be a pantsuit, his presence exuded an air of ominous mystery that sent shivers down my spine. With every nerve on edge, I braced myself for whatever twisted fate awaited me at the hands of this enigmatic intruder. As the figure advanced, each deliberate footfall echoed throughout the room like a sinister drumbeat, amplifying the sense of dread that gripped me with icy fingers. My heart pounded in my chest, a primal instinct urging me to flee, yet a paralyzing fear rooted me to the spot, rendering me helpless in the face of the approaching menace. With every creak of the floorboards beneath his weight, my apprehension intensified, a silent countdown to the inevitable confrontation that loomed ever closer. The figure halted mere inches away from me, its presence suffocating. As it leaned down, its body contorted unnaturally, defying the laws of physics. Bones creaked and cracked as it stretched to peer under the bed without a single movement of its legs. Its gaze pierced through me, sending a chill down my spine. Meanwhile, the voice of the phone in the living room interjected, the front desk lady inquiring, Are you ready to check out, Mr. Blackwood? I said, No, goddammit! Stop asking! My voice echoed with anger and frustration reverberating throughout the room. The man's mouth opened unnaturally wide, his bones cracking as his jaw defied the laws of nature. A chilling scream pierced the air as he grabbed me by my neck, yanking me from the bed and hurtling me against the wall. Pain shot through my head upon impact. He advanced toward me, his hand reaching into my chest, ripping out my heart and squeezing it in his grasp. Darkness enveloped me as consciousness slipped away. As I slowly came to, my vision was hazy, and the steady beeping of a monitor filled the air. With each passing moment, clarity returned, revealing my surroundings. A hospital room. A doctor stood nearby, jotting down notes. When he noticed my awakening, I mustered the strength to inquire. What? <clears throat> what happened? My body throbbed in pain, and I couldn't shake the sensation of discomfort coursing through my bones. Oh, uh, you're awake, the doctor said, glancing up from his notepad. You're at Lakewood Hospital. You were in a horrible car crash. Your wife and son were with you. They're alive, which is actually a miracle, Mr. Blackwood. My heart sank as the doctor delivered the news. A, a car crash? I echoed, disbelief coloring my voice. The mention of my wife and son sent a wave of relief through me, followed by a profound gratitude for their safety. Thank you, I managed to say, my mind reeling with questions about the accident and how we had all survived. Uh, wait, I ask, my voice tinged with confusion and a hint of anxiety. Uh, uh, what's the date? Nah, today's date is August 10th, 2003, the doctor replied calmly, his tone soothing, but my mind raced with questions. So, so the funeral and everything I saw never happened? Is everyone okay? I queried, my voice betraying the lingering unease in my thoughts. Yes, Mr. Blackwood, they are all just fine. 
the doctor reassured me with a gentle nod. So, here's what's going to happen. You're okay, and you don't have any broken bones, just a few cuts on your head and hands, which have been treated. Other than that, you've been taken care of. Are you ready to check out, Mr. Blackwood? The doctor's tone conveyed reassurance, but there was an underlying sense of urgency, as if he wanted to ensure Mr. Blackwood's swift departure of the hospital. Um, I... Um, I stammered, uncertainty evident in my voice as I grappled with conflicting emotions and thoughts. Is my wife and kids coming here? I inquired, a worried expression creasing my features as I awaited the doctor's response, hoping for reassurance. No, um, they're in a different hospital, the doctor explained his tone sympathetic as he delivered the news. This one is packed, so we had to do what we could. But if you're ready to see them, you can check out any time you'd like. He responded with a friendly smile, offering a glimmer of hope in his words. Oh, all right. I'm ready to check out. I replied with a bright look a sense of relief washing over me as I prepared to reunite with my family. Okay, take this clipboard and sign your signature so we can depart and send you down the way, the doctor explained. Uh, sure, just give me a moment, I said, reaching for the clipboard and pen provided by the doctor. As I carefully signed my name, I couldn't shake off the lingering feeling of unease from my surreal experience. After finishing, I handed the doctor the clipboard and Ben, feeling a mix of relief and anticipation. Thank you, Mr. Blackwood, the doctor said, taking the clipboard and pen from me. He glanced over the signature briefly before nodding. You're all set. Follow me and I'll take you to the discharge area. Walking down the hall to the nearest elevator, we stepped into the elevator. The doctor pressed the button for the sixth floor. The doors closed, and a sense of unease settled over me as the elevator began its ascent. The doctor seemed oblivious to my discomfort as he checked his watch, the soft chime of the elevator indicating each passing floor. The elevator door opened, and my heart dropped as I found myself facing the same hallway of the sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Follow me to the discharge area, sir, the doctor said, but I couldn't move. He returned, puzzled. Are you coming? He asked. Why am I back here? I questioned, fear gripping me. Why, to check out, Mr. Blackwood. I thought you wanted to see your family again. The doctor's words felt surreal. It's time to move on, Mr. Blackwood, he insisted. I thought I was in a car crash, I questioned, trying to make sense of the situation and separate reality from illusion. You were, Mr. Blackwood. You died in the car crash with your wife and son. When you went to that funeral, you were in denial. You were also in that casket. You were dead the entire time, Mr. Blackwood, and it's time to move on. So, check out, the doctor said. N -n -n no, this can't be true. H how did I not know? I exclaimed, my expression a mix of confusion and shock. Because you chose not to know. Follow me to the checkout area, the doctor said walking off down the hallway. The chilling scene unfolded before me as I followed him to room 144, labeled with the ominous word, discharge at the top. My heart raced as he opened the door, revealing my own hotel room. My eyes widened in horror as I saw the rope hanging from the ceiling, a stark reminder of the sinister fate that awaited me. Then, to my disbelief, 
The phone in the room spoke out in an eerie voice. Are you ready to check out Mr. Blackwood? The words sent shivers down my spine, filling me with a sense of dread and foreboding. It was as if the hotel itself was taunting me with its own morality, reminding me of the danger lurking within its walls. Fear gripped me tightly as I realized the gravity of the situation. I knew I had to act quickly to escape this nightmare, to unravel the mysteries of the Grand Dolphin Hotel before it was too late. But as I stood frozen in terror, the voice of the front desk lady echoed in my mind, a haunting reminder of the hotel's relentless grip on its guests. As I reluctantly gave in to the sinister forces at play, a sense of resignation washed over me. With a heavy heart, I uttered the words, Yes, I'm ready. Knowing that I was about to take my final journey into the unknown, I moved the living room chair towards the rope, my movements mechanical and devoid of emotion. Climbing onto the chair, I positioned myself beneath the rope, my heart pounding in my chest. With trembling hands, I placed my head through the loop, stealing myself for what was to come. And then, as if on cue, the phone spoke out once more, its voice echoing throughout the room with chilling clarity, as I hung from the rope going to a better place. It was a haunting reminder of the hotel's relentless hold over its guests, a final farewell before the inevitable descent into darkness. Thank you for checking out at the Grand Dolphin Hotel. It has been our pleasure to host you during your stay with us. We hope that you enjoyed our luxurious accommodations, exceptional service, and all the amenities our hotel has to offer. Your satisfaction is our top priority, and we are delighted to have had the opportunity to serve you. We truly appreciate your patronage and look forward to welcoming you back for another wonderful stay in the future. Wishing you safe travels and memorable experiences wherever your journey may take you. Thank you again for choosing the Grand Dolphin Hotel. The next day... Breaking news. We bring you breaking news as tragedy strikes the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Alex Blackwood, a seasoned reporter known for his investigations into the paranormal, was discovered deceased on the sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Mr. Blackwood's demise was attributed to suicide by hanging, with his body found the following day. Mr. Blackwood's untimely death sheds light on the ongoing speculation surrounding the sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Many theorize that this particular floor is haunted, earning the ominous moniker The Devil's Floor due to its association with the number six. Notably, a previous tragic incident saw the loss of 200 lives on a single day, with the clock freezing at the ominous hour of six. In a chilling twist of fate, Mr. Blackwood's own demise echoed this eerie phenomenon, with reports indicating that the clocks stopped at six at the time of his discovery. Despite warnings from the hotel's owner regarding the dangers of investigating the sixth floor, Mr. Blackwood pressed on with his inquiries, ultimately meeting his tragic end. In the wake of Mr. Blackwood's death, other paranormal investigators have expressed interest in exploring the mysteries of the Grand Dolphin Hotel's sixth floor. However, the owner of the hotel has made the decision to step down from his position, singling a somber acknowledgement of the risks associated with delving into the unknown depths of the hotel's haunted history. This sobering turn of events serves as a stark reminder of the dangers inherent in probing the paranormal and the potential consequences of unearthing dark secrets. As the investigation into Mr. Blackwood's death continues, the allure of the sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel remains. 
casting a chilling shadow over those who dare to tread its haunted halls. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to this series, The Sixth Floor. I hope you loved it as much as I did. A heartfelt thank you goes to each and every one of you that also like fictional horror. And with that being said, I'm going to give a very special acknowledgement to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support here on Back to Ashes, because if it weren't for you, I would not be here, and Back to Ashes definitely wouldn't be here. So, thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I really hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, stay safe out there and make sure to take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.